everybody today to the Jesus Movement Podcast. My name is Matthew Lilly. I'll be hosting today, and I'm here with my friend Victor Vieira, yeah. all the way from Brazil. Yes. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great, great to have you with us here. We're here in Kansas City at the Awaken the Dawn Kansas City event leading up to the Send. Yes. And you and I got connected because you helped translate my book, yes. David's Tabernacle, uh, into Portuguese and get it published and distributed in Brazil. Yes. Which I'm very thankful for. Come on. <laughs> and I knew that you'd be here in Kansas City. We hadn't actually met in person yet. Uh huh. And I said, well, hey, let's get together and let's talk and talk about what God's doing in Brazil, mm -hmm. the prayer movement there, and what he's doing among Portuguese-speaking people. And so it's great to have you with us Come on. today. I know that you started a ministry called BASE yes. there in Brazil, and you have a local church that you planted, and you have a publishing company, you release books, obviously, yes. and, and probably do many other things there as well. So man, it's great to have you. Maybe just introduce yourself from your okay. perspective, give a little bit of your story and, and how you came to the Lord and kind of got involved in the prayer movement. Okay, thank you, Matthew, for inviting me. It's it's a blessing to, to engage with what the Lord is doing here in America as the Lord transitioned us here. We just moved here to Kansas City in the, for five months, so it's pretty fresh. We're still getting settled. And, uh, well, uh, I planted... The base uh, as a church, a local church, a uh, publishing company, and also ministry schools and different things that we do in Brazil uh, almost 15 years ago. And I was super young. And it was a amazing journey with the Lord. And How old are you now? I'm 30, 39. <laughs> okay, 39. So yes. you were in your 20s. I was early 20s. Wow. Like recently married. And uh, it was a, quite of a, a journey. We, I, I mean, I, I am like third generation of ministers in my family. So my dad and my grandfather was a Baptist planner, uh, uh, church planner in, in Brazil, uh, last century. And, um, so I, I've never been out of like the, the evangelical Christian family, but I, I got my heart connected with the, the mission of God when I was 16, 18. And I've heard uh, from the Lord, the, the quote, friends of the bridegroom. Mm. That's, that's what really changed my life. Cause I was like a poor, uh, son of a Christian. I was yeah. li living a normal life. But How old were you when you heard this? It was 16. 16 I was 16. Old. Yeah. Wow. And it was so really like out of the blue. never heard of anything like that. Actually on that time, I was thinking that I was, I was getting my mind around the idea that I was the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's been awesome to be loved by Jesus as a bridegroom, and we love to be His bride. So I, I was into really into worship and the affections of God towards me. Mm -hmm. But when He called me to be a friend, it was kind of different because hey, I, I don't want to be friend. I, I want to be a servant. I want to be so I want to go hard after you. And he right. was hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh, we got to be friends first. So in on that in that season, I, I was. Like 18, 16, uh, I typed it on like Alta Vista or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Friends of the bridegroom. And there's nothing in Portuguese. Wow. Nothing. Just yeah. marriage stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I, when I type it in English, Friends of bridegroom, actually, I have KC name by that time. It was Friends of the bridegroom. Right. So it was before they changed it to I hop. So I kind of find in my family when I was super early. And that changed my life forever because I was thinking, hey, if God is calling uh, a ministry and a family uh, to leave that lifestyle, maybe I can figure out what the Lord wants for me by looking at what they're doing and what they're listening to, what they're teaching on, what's their lifestyle. So that's why I learned, hey, these guys, they want to be friends of Bregnall and they pray a lot. Okay, I'll do that. Oh, <laughs> uh, they fast. Okay, I'll add that to my diet. Right. And they read Bible and commentaries. Okay, I'm, I, you know, I'll be into Bible and commentaries. And they, they have a 24-7 prayer room. So all those things I was adding up to my, to, to my life goal plan. Like, I want to be that. I want to live that. And I, I, I want to be one of this generation that the Lord is, is raising up. So my calling was around the, the word of to be a friend of the bridegroom. Mm. But I, I was super young. 
super really mature but I, I was pursuing ministry yeah but uh, the the other side of uh, of what the Lord did in my life and my early calling was that he added up the local church um, components to it yeah and I I like to say that uh, Jesus saved my life but the church also saved my life mm -hmm. like being on. Uh, on an everyday thing and relating to normal people it was just absolutely um, crucial for me to be like with feet on the ground and like I'm a real person with a ministry I'm not like a crazy person out there trying to be prophetic right. so I added the to this prophetic movement, to the prayer movement, and to the supernatural expectations that we all have, the component of the local church. And that actually saved my life from being lost inside a ministry. Mm. So I, I first thing I did was planning a church towards a prayer room. Like always into, we want to have prayer. We want to be a, a, a community of people centered, uh, in, that we host the presence of the Lord in the center of yes. everything. So everything out of that flourished by this first connection I had with the friend of the bridegroom yeah. message. Wow, that's amazing. I love that. Sometimes in the missions, prayer world, it's real easy to, especially for people that are doing it full time, to get isolated, mm -hmm. and kind of get in a bubble where it's like yeah. you know, just with other people that are in full time ministry. But I love that you say yeah. the value of the local church, yes. normal, everyday Christians. Yes. Uh, and just being connected to yes. regular people, being yes. connected to the lost. I really, know? I really consider that that component saved my life to be lost inside a ministry. Yeah. Because what we see is there's uh, uh, there's tons of voices uh, charging people to different uh, important things, but it's disconnected to reality. Mm. And reality right. is the body of Christ that breaks the bread right. every week. Right. It's the, the fellowship of the brethren, it's discipleship, it's to have someone that knows, actually really knows your life and can speak into your life. So that component was really important for me. And that's that's a cool thing too, because I always thought of a prayer movement outside of the church to be for the whole city. Right. And right. I never got it. Yeah. And I, I never had it. Because I, I was thinking, hey, if we have a neutral place yeah. that belongs to anyone but to the city all the people will show up <laughs> that would never happen and i tried i tried sure. like for years yeah and I, we did uh worship gatherings and, and prayer gatherings in local uh places uh, outdoors indoors we did in schools and everywhere trying to be neutral right but when i did through a normal local church expression Actually, people understood what I was doing because it's a just a normal place. Yeah. It's not a weirdo people like doing some crazy mystical things. They're right. just normal pursuing the Lord through prayer. Yeah. So actually, the local church is a really big, important, uh, important component for for my life and my journey. Yeah. I love that. I think you know I've been connected to the prayer movement, you know, for fifteen plus years, I guess, and. Uh, I think that's something the Lord's been doing is I did think there was a sense in which he called some people out kind of on the fringe of the church to really go hard after prayer to provoke the larger body of Christ to prayer, you know, sort of a, in a parachurch missions kind of way. But then it seems like what he's been doing in recent years is bringing prayer back into the local church in a greater way where that you have praying churches and you have churches with a culture of prayer, presence-centered mm -hmm. churches, and so I think um, I think that's just something the Lord is is wanting to do, right? Jesus said, "My house will be a house of prayer." Right? Yes. His church is yes. His house. That's yes. His people. So yes. if His house is going to be a house of prayer, that's not separate from the church. Mm -hmm. That is the church. Actually, that's church identity. Be. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And even for me personally, I'm in a journey where. Uh, I'm working right now just in the last few months to begin to build a prayer room within a local church that I'm a part of. And yes. so, uh, and it's different. Yes. <laughs> it is different. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we're going to see more and more. You need that. to have in mind the mom that can go hard all day long. You, right. have, you need to have in mind the older that like need to, the sound system a little lower. Right. So you, net, you, hear, you, you need to consider things that when we are young, we don't really care about yeah 
But when we are we are have a family, we have babies, and we have yeah. like bills and everything, it's more realistic to build it inside the church. And even IHOP KC, where where I'm part of, uh, we are a church, mm -hmm. and it really depends on how you see. You can see as a mission base, you can see as a ministry, but actually, what we are is a family. Yeah. We are a local church, yeah. so. I think it. I think that's that's helpful to, and actually the the church is also a safer environment, mm. so people can have accountability. Right. They can just go crazy and do anything in the name of the prophetic, right. and in that really can happen in prayer meetings. Yeah. So yeah, I love that. And churches can work together still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have local churches that connect together to pray or to do missions. Yeah, initiatives or whatever. So you can still Absolutely. have citywide unity and different sure. expression of that. Um, but that that every church would be a house of prayer. That every church would have a culture of prayer. And, and I think that that really helps pastors to connect mm -hmm. because they understand church. They yeah. don't understand house of prayer. Yeah. So when they say hey, what 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 are you, and you say <laughs> I'm a house of prayer. So what yeah. what is that? Right. Are you trying to seal my members? Are what right. are you are you trying to get my youth? Mm -hmm. So no, we are just a church. Yeah. Okay, so we can relate to pastors like hey, I understand how church works. Right. So that's I think that breaks the the barrier and brings more unity when people are aware of what we are doing and we have clarity about what we are. Right. Right. I love that. Well, how have you gotten connected to the broader prayer movement in Brazil? Because yeah. I know you've got. A local church that you helped start, but I know that you're resourcing the body of Christ in that nation, and now you're here at IHOP yes. in order to do that even more to resource Brazil and other Portuguese-speaking nations and people. Um, so, how did God kind of take your little, you yeah. know, thing you're doing in your town, and how did He kind of connect you to the the bigger picture? Well, one one thing that the Lord is really making clear to me is the importance of to have a healthy ecosystem. Mm. So early in my teenagers, I decided that I would build an ecosystem around prayer, prophetic, and what the Lord is doing in this generation. Mm. So what ecosystem means to me is that I'll be feeding myself and investing in things that I want to be when I'm older or when I when I get there. So my people obviously was the main Person, uh, person, and the, the main guy in my ecosystem. So I started to uh, uh, eat everything he was preaching. So I I paid to have the prayer room uh, online. Went back in the day when you had to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I bought all the books, I bought all the CDs, and all the courses I could do at, for I Help You, and I started to feed myself on it. But I, I was thinking, hey, what? Who Mike's? Uh, who might suggest suggests when it's about Christology? Mm -hmm. So I met Alan Hood. Mm -hmm. So what's the guy for Mike for end times? Oh, oh there's David Slyker. So I started to build like a, a, a want to listen from all those guys that they're part of the ecosystem. I want to be part of. And I started to I have dig. a question for you. Did you uh -huh. have to learn English to absolutely to lean from all these people? You did, yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> I, I I learned English myself. Wow! But it was back in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, and I actually learned English by listening to hardcore music <laughs> and translating word by word in the dictionary from the songs because <laughs> there's no Google at that time. Yeah. And I was, I want to understand the message. I want to, to understand what those guys are singing. So I was like trying to translate word by word in the dictionary from the CDs. That's awesome. You remember back in the day when we were, have CDs and have booklets. Yeah. <laughs> so I got my English from that because I, I was listening to it and I was reading and I was looking for, for the meaning of the words in the dictionary word by word. Oh, that's that's awesome. That's kind of my... Uh, free time, what I do. I would yeah. translate songs. Sure. So I, <laughs> Was this Christian hardcore music? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I loved Tooth and Nail, Face oh, yeah. Down music, and all those hardcore bands from the from California, Seattle. So I... That's fun. Like, to be here in America now and to see all those guys uh, traveling 
through Kansas City, it's kind of crazy for me. Cause sometimes I feel like, hey, I wish I was a teenager again. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, uh, it was uh, it was through that. It was I got my English translating songs. So I, that's the power of the music, and when you go after the the, the meaning of the song, mm -hmm. and so you're doing that learning English, so mm -hmm. that way you can listen to some of these guys' yes. teachings, yes. and, and yes. learn from them. And I, I started to take chances translating people because you always have that missionary that comes from America or from Africa or somewhere else. They are visiting town, and I was just there. They say, "Hey, can I help?" I speak a little English. I can translate something. So Randy Clark would bring like 10 buses of Americans to pray for people. Mm -hmm. So I would recruit myself. Hey, I want to be one of the translators yeah. to re uh, help Randy's uh, crusades in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So I got my English from that. Yeah. And after that, I started to build what I call the ecosystem. So when Mike was, say, he was quoting in his books like lead, or uh, yeah, Walter Kaiser, so I, who's those guys? So I bought all the books of, of each one, mm. and I started to build what I want to be around what those guys were coding. Mm. So I think this is the importance of our ecosystem. And I uh, became like full of resources, and we started to translate everything that I have had into Portuguese. And the first book, book we published was uh, End Time Simplified by David Slyker. Mm -hmm. And after that, we translated like 20 plus books. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was such a, a, a good journey to be uh, faithful in the small beginnings and to gather the resources. And after that, we started to spread out the message of the intimacy of Jesus, the prayer thing, and also the end times. So we became a, a hub of information and resources we can fed different places in, in, in Brazil in different houses of prayer. Mm -hmm. We also started um, uh, an online school and that's, that was super helpful during, especially during the pandemic years. Yeah. But we, we only could do that because of the resources we gathered the years before. Nice. So yeah, we, we, we have friends and we are connected all over Brazil and even outside like Portugal and other uh, Mozambique, other Portuguese speaking countries. Mm -hmm. And, and we want to fed them with like all we have. So we, yeah. we fly to Africa and we bring a suitcases of books. Oh, yeah. So we got there and we open and we give freely to all the, the African pastors and, and they, we just help to set the culture. We fly to Portugal and we drink, we bring like back in suitcases of books. Yeah. We want to resource the church, so that that yeah. became a, a a really important thing to me. But it was because I was doing it to myself, and I saw the benefits I I reaped from investing in what I call the, the ecosystem. That's so good. I love it. I encourage anybody that's tuning in, like take the time. There's so many resources out there to learn and to grow and to encourage uh, in in your faith. And I think there is such wisdom. I don't know where you got that, but just hunger from God, I guess, to learn and to grow, but that desire yeah. to learn and to keep digging and to go deeper. Yeah. Uh, for anybody that wants it, God will meet you if you're hungry and you're reaching and you're wanting to learn, you're wanting to grow in the scriptures, you're wanting to grow in understanding of who he is. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are so many resources out there to help you and encourage you. So, uh, Victor, I've heard, I've never been to Brazil, mm -hmm. but I've just heard that The Brazilian church is on fire. <laughs> yeah. And that there's so much hunger. And, I, you know, I know when the send went to Brazil that they had multiple stadiums that kept selling out and overflowing. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've just seen videos and heard stories of, of just uh, the fiery Brazilian believers. And so, man, what is, what is your sense of what God's doing? You know, just we're the Jesus Movement podcast. So we're, we're kind of like we want to be a part of what God's doing in the earth and, and in his church. So just give us a sense of like what God's doing in Brazil. Well, man, it, it's real. It's really uh, powerful what the Lord is doing in the nation of Brazil. Uh, when we see from outside that we learn the best, we see the best because being here now in America, we can notice the difference and taste the, well, we were super blessed back in Brazil. <laughs> that 
uh, regard. Yeah. And the Lord is really moving in the in the youth and actually in the new breed of leaders that are raising up now. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a continuation of what the Lord started like in the in the eighties, mm-hmm. uh, renewing worship, and in the nineties and the two thousands with the spontaneous music and the intimacy with the Lord. And uh, what I see is that the Lord is always uh, uh, highlighting Brazil as a worshiping nation and as a, a nation that will lead uh, the worship in the prayer movement. We are not leading everything, but I think the worship part and the musical part, we, we have something. I don't know if it's the blood <laughs> or something that we have mixed it from Africa and the native and the, the European. It's it's something that really burns in our hearts to, to be extravagant. So you mm-hmm. can go anywhere in Brazil and you will see a fury, uh, really fury um, service. People are giving themselves in, in worship, being extravagant. And that's a reality. And I think this is a blessing. And uh, I think the Lord can use that to inspire our nations on how to give themselves in worship too. Mm-hmm. So I think the part that America gives uh, to contributes to the movement is their organization and the right. resources and everything. I think the part we bring to the table is the fire. Yeah. So uh, we, if, if we can mix that and make that happen together, yeah. we can have like organized, organized fire. As my friend <laughs> Raphael says, uh, he, he's oh preaching God. organized fire because oh we God. bring something to the table that is different. Yeah. And I think this is our part. We are passionate and we can build uh, with uh, few resources. Yeah. If we, uh, I think that's a, a cool thing that when a missionary from America goes to the field, he will ask, hey, where, where is the Starbucks? So, and we, <laughs> we don't have that. We just grow it up in a, in, in a, like in a broken city, in a poor situation, and we are more ready and willing to to be okay with what we have and just go after the Lord with small resources and build from scratch. I think we are not waiting for everything to be perfect and line it up before it's starting. We just start and see what happens. Yeah. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't <laughs> work, but it's yeah, pretty fun to see the, the, the process. And I think Brazilians can serve and help the nations with the fire inspiration. I yeah. think we are we are passionate about it. We'll always cry about it. We'll always be yeah. like really digging in. And I think this is our what we're bringing to the table of the Lord now. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, before we are done here, I want to get you to pray for us. And sure. Just just pray for that fire to come on the American church. Oh yes, because we want to we want to receive that. So. Hey, um, I know you've written a couple books yourself. Yes, and you're not just translating other people's yes, books. But yes, you, yes. You, you, you know, as you've been studying, God's given you some insight and revelation. So, tell us about some of the the books you've written. Um, well, as as I, I told you, my 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 value for resources and for reading resources, it's really important to me because what I saw taking place in Brazil also a few years ago is that we were passionate, but our fires uh, is easily quenched because Mm -hmm. we don't have the resources to keep it burning in a logical way. Mm -hmm. So I think books and theology is actually an awesome tool that the Lord has given us to be on fire and keep going, keep the fire going for decades until the Lord returns. So uh, I started publishing American uh, authors and I was never like courageous enough to publish myself. But a few years ago, I published a book called uh, Essential Eschatology, which is a, a, it's a, a easy way to approach one of the hardest subjects in the whole theology realm. And for but, folks that don't know eschatology, yes. that's the study of the end times. Yes. Right. So there, and there is like at least main four, four main views in eschatology. And so I, I give a pretty fair uh, introduction to all of them, oh, cool. and I defend my point in okay. the end. So I, I present topics on like the second coming, great tribulation, Israel, and the, the so the the main topics of eschatology. I I present it really simple, and it makes it it makes really uh, 
easy to, to people to get it, get the mind around it. So I think one of the, the cool things that the Lord has given me is the ability to, to speak and to be clear in not so clear topics. Mm. And I started to, 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 to publish myself. And it was a big blessing in Brazil. The book is out in Spanish too. And now it's going to be out in, in English soon. Oh, good. Yeah, we are, we are working on that. Yeah. And I wrote, I wrote another book called uh, Walking in Light. It's about the confession of sins and opening our lives, and that's the the that's uh, the thing that I is the component, the church, mm. to have someone to walk in the light with. Yeah. So this is, and I give a bunch of practical ways to how to to walk in light. Yeah. And I'm also finishing a book right now. It's I don't know, decided the name yet, okay. but it's on prayer. Oh yeah. It is on of course. eight subjects on prayer, mm. and it's mostly. Uh, how to to get a how to get around the presence of the Lord, knowing that He loves our presence more than we think, mm -hmm. and more than we love His presence, He desired us forever. Mm -hmm. So I make some points and arguments about um, how how the Lord how the Lord desires us and how He prays for us. Mm -hmm. and, and by the end of the book, I go in the way that how uh, how can we be practical on that point and how theologically. Prayer is important to the conclusion of the God, of God's plan. Mm. So it's it's around prayer. I think it's super it's super uh, down to earth and easy to relate, and I think it will help people. So I'm I'm adventuring myself in in writing. I, I yeah. love it. Yeah, I love it. Well, you're obviously well read, so I'm sure they're great. I can't wait to have them translated into English. So yes, and so everybody be tuned in to Come on. keep an eye out for Victor Vieira. Yes, book in English for those of you that don't know Portuguese. Yes. <laughs> so, hey, uh, if you don't mind, let's let's rabbit trail into the end times just for a minute. And Absolutely, I'd love to just like whet people's appetite a little bit and just mm -hmm. you know, I think for a lot of people it's an overwhelming mm -hmm. thing to even even for Christians that love Jesus uh, to begin to try to wrap their minds around what the Bible says about end times. So I guess one question would be like, why does it even matter? You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, they go, oh, I don't know. It'll all pan out in the end. You know, people say they're pan millennial because it'll yeah. all pan out in the end. And so like, w why is it even important? Do you think that we take the time to understand the different perspectives and study it out yeah. ourselves? Well, I would, I would go on that way that would you go to the movie, to the movies and go out of the movies and not watch the last 10 minutes of the movie. <laughs> It'd be horrible. That would be the worst. <laughs> like you watch everything, but you don't never know how it ends. Yeah. So I think eschatology is what, uh, it's the subject uh, and the study of the end, of the things concerning the end. And it's super important related to the uh, Christian life, normal Christian life, because the way you see the end impacts uh, your reality now. Mm -hmm. So you go to job every day because you know by the end of, of the week or by the end of the month, what? You got the payment. Right. That's the end. That's yeah. the goal. So why would we live a Christian life without knowing how it ends? Yeah. So it, it really doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, if we don't know the end or we don't have an expectation for the end, we would leave now anyhow, or it doesn't matter right. because I don't care about what is going on or what is, what is the, the end game. Yeah. So it, I think eschatology have the power to change the reality of believers now because yeah. we'll bring meaning and we'll bring uh, really uh, uh, ability to endure now yeah. because of the the reward because of the reality because of the future you know we we live in a society that everybody is anxious about today and tomorrow and everybody's trying to catch up everything on instagram because they are anxious about now what if we believers could be anxious and have expectation about the next billion years mm. so wow. we, we don't think about that we think wow. that life is hey I don't know if I'll retire. I don't know if I even have a job or something like that. But actually, life is not just the 70 years. Yeah. 
is actually a billion years before or after. Yeah. So, and we are trying to rewire our minds that, hey, guys, let's look up. Mm-hmm. And there's a bigger story. Yeah. So eschatology, I think, have the power to change how a Christian lives his life. Yeah. And uh, also, when we add the reality of eternity to the conversation, we will live and take decisions really differently than, we, than what and how we do it now. Yeah. Because we will consider the implications of eternal rewards of eternal punishment. Mm. So it's really important. It's not a it's not a thing just about being a better person, a better better family. It's where uh, it's a matter of eternity. Yeah. And we and sometimes we, we don't talk much about that in church anymore. Mm-hmm. And we, we think that Christianity is something that helps us to live a better life just now and to have a better marriage, to have a better job, to have better finances and just to make it life and now work. But actually, it's not. Mm-hmm. Jesus says that you will have life when you die. Mm-hmm. And you will be big. You will, you, will be the, it, you, will, you will be important when you go low. So it's right now, life must be impacted by the reward of what we go through. And not just be a, a pill that we take to go through another week. Yeah. So I think eschatology, it's really about bringing us hope because yeah, without hope, we can't endure challenges in life. So uh, Apostle Paul says in, in the first Thessalonians that, hey, guys, don't cry for the dead like the Gentiles does yeah. because we have a different hope. Yeah. Not that we are not cry, but we have a different hope. Yeah. But most of Christians don't have it. And they cry and they go in despair and depression and everything, just like non-Christians does. So something is really wrong be, uh, when we don't have an end in mind now. And and I think there's a billion things that I would say about that. Yeah, the whole book you've read. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can go for it for hours. I uh, love but, that. But you know, I, the, 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 if we don't have a right view of how things are going to be in the future, we're not going to live right now. I love that. That's, yes. that's so simple, but it's so important. You go, oh my goodness, uh, we need to we need to think about billion years from now, not mm-hmm. just five years from now, mm-hmm. ten years from now. Yeah. And I love that you said hope too, because I, you know, I've been just looking at that that verse in Ephesians one eighteen that you know God would open the eyes of our heart to know the hope of His calling. Yeah. And I've just been thinking about that phrase, the hope of his calling. And so many times we think of calling as, oh, well, I'm called to this job or I'm called into ministry or mm-hmm. I'm called to the marketplace. And we think of it in terms of our personal, yes, like vocational calling. What's our job? What's our vocation? But that's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about being called into the kingdom of God, being invited uh, into relationship with the Lord and into his kingdom for all of eternity. And that's why it gives us hope mm-hmm. is because we go, Oh, I'm called to be with you, God forever and yes. called to be rule and reign with you in your kingdom forever. Yeah. And I have hope. Yeah. And that's the hope of his calling no matter what we're going through. I mean, if anybody who's tuning in, if you didn't feel hope over the last couple of years in the yeah. midst of the pandemic and yes. you said, Oh no, it's hopeless. The world's falling apart. You know, the stock market's crashing, the, you know, inflation's going through the roof, but like those who are rooted in that eternal hope, there's a steadiness in our hearts, even in the midst of whatever we might have to go through, you know, and increasing pressures that may come, we go, there's hope in our hearts Absolutely. Um, because we're rooted in that eternal perspective. So you're getting me fired up about this. Come on, <laughs> Come on now. I, I think the matter of hope is a bit absolutely important for the church right now because the pandemic was just a reversal. Yeah. of the challenges there. They're not going away. Yeah. Life is not going easier. It's not going to be easier again. Mm-hmm. There's not normal again. So the, the challenge will increase. The, the, the society will, will be, yeah, any, any month there will be another, another crisis. And it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, the, the world is not being conquered by Christianity as we we we've heard that we would take over everything. It's it's going to be insane. But the uh, the question is, how did you went through the pandemic? It was a real parcel. Mm-hmm. You need to get ready. You need to settle your heart 
in an eternal perspective that gives you hope to endure and to also expect for better things, mm -hmm. expect for eternal things. Yes. And even the apostles, they were challenged by, by Jesus to think eternity. So when, when the disciple says, hey, Jesus, what we get because we, we left everything behind. You reign and rule with me in my kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, Apostle Paul, what do you get by uh, giving up on everything in your life? I'm going after the reward of the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually really, it's really important to change your perspective of what is to be successful, what is reality, what is eternity, what is actually reality, and what is gain mm -hmm. for a Christian. And... I think I think eschatology and actually the, the, the plan of God through the whole Bible mm -hmm. gives us this uh, perspective. But it's kind of unfair for us uh, uh, to get in the last book of the Bible and say, hey, it's too hard to understand when we didn't uh, have the, the homework of the previous books. Ah, so actually, people think that eschatology and the book of Revelation is hard. But actually, the book of Revelation is uh, borrowing figures and symbols and everything from, from everywhere. That's right. Even Jesus, when he says, hey, go read Daniel. Yeah. In, the, in his message of, on, on end times of Matthew 24. 24 yeah. So it's really important for us to understand that the Bible is, a, is one story with beginning, middle, and an end. Yeah. And if we skip the end... We, we got caught in a, in a kind of Buddhist Christianity that there is just a loop of every week trying to be better. Right. But no, the story is going to an end. There's a plan and there's a king and there's a glorious city coming down from earth. There's like angels are staring from the balcony of heaven to see those who will live for eternity and to that kind of expectation. And we are about to, to see great crisis, but the Lord said that those full of understanding will shine and bright like stars mm. forever. Dude, we, we are called to, to shine. We are wow. called to burn. We are called to, to be those full of the knowledge of God, and full yes. of, of the wisdom of, of the Lord, full of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And actually our destiny is to shine. Yeah. And it's... It's it's just more it's just cooler than anything we can think that Christianity goes after or gives you. I think it's to be with Jesus forever, to know Him, yes. to about, uh, to to live with Him in the same city forever, where there's no sun because His face shines like the sun, yeah. and like there's so much hope in our future, yes. and we are caught on this age. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's look towards eternity. I love that, man. That's so good. I just feel the the presence of God on all that. Hey, I'd love for you to, to pray over our sure our podcast family and community. And if you have any closing thoughts, you're welcome to share that. But I'd love for you to just to, to pray over us, mostly people in America who are mm -hmm. worshipers, intercessors, hungry for God. Yeah, just pray for more fire. Maybe pray into some of what you were just sharing. Sure. Just say a quick prayer verse. Okay. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your presence. Thank you for that you really cares about our future and our destiny. And right now, I ask you that you pour out your spirit over us, mm -hmm. and you will seal our hearts with your fiery love, and seal our arms, and seal us close in your love. Jesus, I ask you for a new breath, a new move of your spirit in America. And all of those that are listening to this message, to this talk, all, all of those that have, like, uh, they have expectations on what you're doing next and what new things you're doing in this season, in this time. God, let us be caught in your story and let us live for your glory uh, as a spiritual family, as friends of the bridegroom. Jesus, I ask you for the fire of love, sealing every heart right now. I ask Jesus that the gift that you gave to the nation of Brazil would be imparted to America yes. and bring your fire down in this place. Jesus, we ask you for revival. We ask oh. you that you 
breathe again on dry bones. Mm -hmm. Jesus, uh, make it happen just as you did in the days of old. We believe for stories uh, again taking place in America, we call forth a third great awakening. We ask, we ask you, Jesus, come and send revival. We need your presence. We need you in here. We need you here. And Jesus, we, we, we just love what you're doing in our lives in this season. And we are thankful. We are grateful. But we, we want more. Yeah. We just want more of you. More everything we could have of you. We want it. We ask him. And I ask Jesus that you give more to those who hunger, to those who thirsty for you. Jesus, even now, those who are listening to this prayer, Jesus, give them more. Give them more revelation. Give more of your spirit. Give them more of uh, uh, knowledge of the word. Jesus, visit this people. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.